Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sherry Goodman, Director of Education here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. And I'm very happy to welcome you to our symposium today, which is being held in conjunction with our new exhibition, Hinges, Sakaki Hyakusen and the Birth of Nanga Painting. The exhibition, which opened just this past week, uh, has been organized by BAMPFA Senior Curator for Asian Art, Julia White. Uh, <clears throat> for today's program, yes. <laughs> For today's program, Julie will be offering a brief overview of the exhibition to set the stage. Uh, she will also be introducing our distinguished uh, speakers, who are Richard Pegg, Patricia Graham, and Felice Fisher, and then she'll be moderating a uh, discussion. Uh, Julia has served as our senior curator for Asian art since 2006, and prior to that, at the Honolulu Museum of Art. She has organized a number of landmark exhibitions uh, here at BAMPFA in a wide variety of areas of Asian art, including last fall's extremely well-received exhibition, Repentant Monk, Illusion and Disillusion in the Art of Chen Hongshou. Beyond Sakaki Hyakusen, we currently have two other of Julia's exhibitions on view, Meditation in Motion, Zen Calligraphy from the Stuart Katz Collection, from the which is on the museum's main level, and on the lower level, Divine Women, Divine Wisdom. So there's a lot to see here today. Um, now, on behalf of the museum, uh, I'd like to extend our heartfelt thanks to those who have made the exhibition possible. Lead support has been provided by the Henry and Tomoyo Takahashi Charitable Foundation. Major support comes from Christine Johnson and Tim Dattels. Additional support has been given by the BAMPFA Asian Art Endowment Fund, Hanley Tse Ho, Christopher Tse Ning, and Jonathan Tse Chien Leung, the Blakemore Foundation, Bonham's Japanese Art, New York and San Francisco, the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, Jan Debevoise in memory of Professor James Cahill, Grace S. Chang and Jennifer Y. Chang, Julia and John Curtis, Dr. Rudy F. Tooney and David B. Franklin, and Nobuko and Alan Zeka. The exhibition catalog was made possible with support from the Metropolitan Center for Far Eastern Art Studies. And special thanks to Professor Dana Buntrock and Kumi Hadler of the UC Berkeley Center for Japanese Studies for their generous support of today's symposium. And now, Julia White. Thank you very much, Sherry, for your kind introduction and also for organizing this colloquium and uh, helping to make sure all of the arrangements and speakers were well cared for over the last few days. Um, uh, in way of uh, introduction to this colloquium, I would like to first recognize and thank several individuals who have collaborated with me on the research, the organization, and the catalog for the show. The exhibition would not have been possible without the contributions of Felice Fisher, the Luther W. Brady Curator of Asian Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and Kyoko Kinoshita from Tama University. Uh, these two noted scholars lent their amazing expertise to the project, and their connoisseurship has helped to shape the selection of paintings seen in the exhibition. In addition, I'd like to acknowledge the master conservator Tomokazu Kawazu of Sogendo Studio, who's also here today, um, who, is, um, who works in Alameda, and thank him for his incredible work on our mountain landscape, the pair of screens which he diligently worked on for over two years in preparation for this exhibition. This is the first exhibition in the U.S. to examine in depth the founder of a new school of painting that arose in Japan in the early 18th century. Sikaki Hakusen is hardly a household name, yet his painting style led to a movement and school that dominated Japanese painting for two centuries. Known as Nanga, or Southern Style Painting, it was based on Chinese precedence. Although Japan was tightly closed to the outside world at this time, 
Certain Chinese goods, and in, including paintings and woodblock printed books, arrived in Japan on a wave of interest by the shogun. And all things Chinese, especially Chinese literature, poetry, and culture, were pursued. Defining Hyakusen's um, personal style is difficult due to the fact that he seems to have tried every style, composition, and brushwork that he saw, as you can see from the works on the screen, which are all by Hyakusen, um, and all quite different. In addition, he was a professional artist who was commissioned to do specific types of works for patrons, which probably influenced at least some of his output. By now, I hope you've had a chance to look, at the, look in the gallery and see that the exhibition includes many paintings by Hyakusen, as well as several of his contemporaries and those artists who followed in his footsteps. Our intention in this exhibition was, is to show Hyakusen as a pivotal figure early on in the Nanga movement. We might even consider him personally and his work as a hinge between China and Japan. He was born in 1697 and died in 1752, but during his short lifetime, he exerted great influence on this new style of painting. He was born in Nagoya to a family that may have had ancestral ties to China, and we propose in this exhibition that he may have had access to real Chinese paintings. The exhibition consists of paintings by Hyakusan drawn from collections across the country, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Minneapolis Institute of Art, the Asian Art Museum, and Philadelphia Museum of Art, as well as our own BAM PFA um, collections and loan collection, the important Cahill collection on long-term loan to this institution. Uh, we're very grateful that these important institutions have entrusted us with so many of their great treasures. This pair of screens uh, of a landscape executed on gold and silver background was regarded by um, the late Professor Emeritus James Cahill, and I quote, to be not only genuine, but also to be among the finest works by this superb artist of the 18th century. Cahill was the leading authority on Hyakusen, and in 1978 he published, through our own Institute for East Asian Studies here at Berkeley, the first study dedicated to exploring Hyakusen's influential career, at least in English. The Sumitomo Foundation agreed with Cahill's assessment and provided BAM PFA with significant funds to have the screens conserved by uh, the leading master conservator, Mr. Kawazu. Documentation of the conservation process is included in both the catalog and the gallery. The acquisition of the screens and their subsequent conservation became the inspiration for this exhibition. In addition, Professor Cahill was one of very few Western scholars who wrote in, wrote in depth about Hyakusen and his influence and he greatly um, really influenced and shaped this exhibition as well. His writings created a roadmap for further examination of the interaction between Chinese painters who influenced Hyakusen and the Japanese artists who followed in his footsteps. Here's a couple of uh, close-ups of um, images from the screen. I hope you'll have time today or later when you come back to the museum to take a look at, at the beauty and um, delicacy of some of the um, painting on these screens. I'm just going to talk briefly about the conservation project because it was so important to the success of, of this um, exhibition. As I said, it was, uh, the conservation was supported by the Sumitomo Foundation, which is a Japanese-based foundation uh, that supports the conservation of important works of Japanese art outside of Japan. This was a full two-year project and proved to be extremely challenging for the conservator. And um, the foundation principals, however, have visited uh, the museum to see the final results and we're really very pleased with Mr. Kawazu's work as we are as well at the museum. Mr. Kawazu's professional report on the project is a model of documentation of Asian conservation and provided us with a great deal of specialized knowledge of these screens. I hope you enjoy reading uh, his report in the catalog as well as seeing some of the images in the exhibition. I'm just going to quickly show you some of the uh, challenges that Mr. Kawazu faced and how he addressed the conservation. Of course, this does not do justice at all to his very fine report, but it does give you a glimpse into um, some of the processes. The screens came to us in very, very poor condition. Uh, the painted surface was, was good, but the um, the support for the screens was very poor, so that was a real challenge, as was the fact that the, screen, the painting is on a gold and silver wash, so um, the process was compound, the difficulty of the process was compounded by those materials. Now 
Nothing like seeing the inside of your screens. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Kwazer also very um, wisely selected new materials for the backing of the screens and um, actually did the stenciling himself as well as dyeing of the, s the surrounding borders. And of course, what you're going to see in the gallery is something quite different than what you're seeing on the screen. But I thought it was is of interest to uh, take note of, of what, uh, what the challenges were. And of course, this is the finished product. And um, you can see that he's really... Um, brought back to life a very important, previously unknown work by um, Hyakusen. So I'm going to just speak briefly about the Chinese influences in Nanga landscape painting because we have one of our speakers, uh, Richard Pegg, will be uh, going um, into more detail about it. But when you go into the exhibition, you'll see that the first room is, is dedicated to mainly to the Chinese influences on uh, the Nanga paintings in the show. Um, this is a page from the Jie Zuyan, um, which is a woodblock printed book that we know had some influence on the, Chinese, on the Japanese painters. Uh, woodblock printed books were certainly available in Japan by this time. And um, very often they had paintings by famous artists, which were then those, those, both the compositions, the techniques, um, um, the arrangement of the, of the, the paintings by the Nanga painters were heavily influenced by, by these um, printed sources. Um, some, a painting that's right at the very beginning of the exhibition, which is sort of an anomaly in that it has these beautiful Chinese ladies right in the front of the exhibition, and this is the last that you'll see of pretty ladies in the show. Um, but it is a beautiful work, um, uh, Ladies by a Stream by Hyakusen, and you can see in the composition and also, of course, in the style of dress of the ladies, a strong Chinese influence. Another painting that shows a strong uh, Chinese influence, particularly in the composition with this very bold, high uh, ridged mountain going up one side of the painting, um, is dated to about 1750, which is very late in the artist's life. He died in 1752. This painting is, um, we borrowed from the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and I think it's really a masterpiece of his later style. He was a very confident artist by this time, and his brushwork is, is extremely strong and, and fluid throughout this painting. One of the artists that um, we know had some influence on, a Chinese artist that had some influence on the uh, Nanga painters very early on is Sheng Mao Ye. And we fortunately have a very beautiful painting called um, Waterfall on Mount Lu by Sheng Mao Ye, who was a Chinese artist who worked uh, between 1580 and 1640. And again, as a part of this exhibition process, we um, invited the uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts conservator to c completely remount this painting and conserve it. So it's in pristine condition. And if you have seen it in other exhibitions at this institution, you'll, you'll be amazed, I think, at how great it looks now. It's been put into a proper mount and, and uh, really shines. I'm not going to go into this artist's influence so much because I know that Richard is going to be speaking about it, but I thought I would pull that forward, as well as this work by Tang Yin from a private collection, which also shows the kind of things that Nanga artists were considering, whether or not they actually saw an original work or they saw woodblock printed pages, uh, we don't really know. However, Hyakusen in his Tokyo uh, National Museum pair of screens does make note of both Sheng Mao Ye and Tang Yin in his inscription. Unfortunately, we weren't able to borrow these screens for the exhibition, but um, uh, they're quite um, beautiful and perhaps distantly related to these two um, Chinese artists. Another work by Sheng Mao Ye that I think Richard will probably discuss in greater depth is this uh, painting that's at the um, University Art Museum at, in Michigan. Um, it's the Orchid Pavilion Gathering from 1621. It's a hand scroll that um, it seems quite clear that um, at least compositionally, some of the uh, Nanga artists, perhaps even Hyakusen, took his cues from. Uh, this is another um, just image from that. And if you were to have a close-up of the Tokyo National um, Museum screen, you would see that um, there is some similarity in the organization. A painting that we do have in the gallery is by Lan Ying, a, uh, another Chinese artist. This is a, a hand scroll of basically the area around Hangzhou, the West Lake. And, it is um, dated to 1623, 
And it's included in the exhibition as a type of painting that was uh, seen by Japanese painters who were very likely very much influenced by the composition themes and the brushwork. So you see this sort of watery landscape, which um, later Nanga artists do take up and um, explore, particularly in this theme of, of boating on the, on the lake. One of the most important aspects of this painting to this exhibition, however, is a colophon that's at the end of the uh, scroll by the Obaku um, Chinese monk, uh, Shingi Duli, and uh, places the painting uh, in Japan by the 1660s. And you can see more of this kind of work upstairs in our calligraphy exhibition, um, Meditation in Motion, that Sherry mentioned. And I'm, uh, Pat Graham will be discussing the influences of Obaku today, this afternoon. So the sole woman artist in the exhibition is represented by three really stellar works, including this very masterful in, uh, interpretation of the Chinese theme of uh, the West Lake. And Kyoko Kinoshita, who's the leading expert on this artist, is I think here today, I hope so. Yep, there she is, good. Uh, and hopefully we can, we can uh, coax her to say a few words about, about this artist in her discussion. This is a, a great work. You may have seen this work before here at the museum in uh, an exhibition we did of Bill Clark's collection because it was originally in Bill Clark's collection and then uh, was acquired by the Minneapolis uh, Institute of Art. This is uh, a little scene from that painting, very wonderful little um, vignette of um, men in boats on the waves. Another artist who, was, uh, who took up the theme of the West Lake is uh, Yosa Busan, who painted this um, West Lake in the springtime at about, uh, in about 1777. Uh, this painting is also from the Asian Art Museum, thanks to them that we're able to show it here. Um, two, two works um, uh, by other artists, Gian Nankai and, and uh, Yanagasawa Kien, who uh, both were of Hyaku's generation, are represented just by a single painting each in the exhibition. Um, this work um, by Nankai was, um, is, is huge. I mean, you'll be, you undoubtedly be impressed. It's a, it's a very grand painting. And in his inscription in Chinese at the top of the painting, he says that he painted it after a painting by um, Wang Meng of the 14th century. So there's this direct link to the, the Chinese source in this painting. And then this work by um, Qian, of the, which is a blue and green landscape. He is also a, a contemporary of Hyakusen. Uh, but painted uh, and painted in a Nanga style, but he also is drawing heavily from the woodblock printed books, uh, quite clearly in the very heavy patterning of his uh, painting. Hyakusen continued in different directions in his uh, painting of landscape. We have a whole variety of paintings that um, show, show his ability in this style. And then this work by Yosobusan is a, one that you can sort of feel the, the uh, influences of uh, Hyakusen and of the Chinese um, literati precedents. Another work, um, this one by Taiga, so the greats of um, the, the high point of Nanga painting, Hyakusen, Gyokuren, Busan, and Taiga are all well represented in the exhibition in their landscape painting. Um, then the final section of the exhibition uh, considers poets and painters and their intersections and interactions. And Felice Fisher will be addressing this um, uh, in her talk this afternoon. Uh, it's a sweet corner of great works by both Hyakusen in uh, his landscape um, mode and also in his figural works, um, including this work that I know Felice is going to cover uh, in some depth. Um, but it, Definitely shows Hyakusen's knowledge of, of Japanese poetry as well as his interest in Chinese things. And then um, finally, Man in a Hut by Hyakusen has that very sketchy type of landscape. This is a painting that's at uh, BAM PFA. Uh, a few more works in this uh, poet's corner include um, Busan's Sea in Spring from um, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and then um, the scenes from the Narrow Road to the Deep North. Uh, by Busan, and we have two great examples of, of that um, uh, theme 
in the exhibition. And then finally, this wonderful little hand scroll of uh, Goshen's seven haiku poets that I'm sure Felice will elaborate on. Um, we have a catalog that's available in the bookstore. It was published by UC Press, and it includes essays by myself, Felice Fisher, um, Kyoko uh, Kinosta, and um, also Mr. Kawazu's uh, conservation report. So um, I encourage you to spend some time in the exhibition um, taking long looks at many of these beautiful paintings that are really, um, it's really a treat to have them here in, in, um, in Berkeley. So now I, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce the speakers today and I'm going to introduce everyone up front now and then um, after their talks we'll have a chance to have some questions and some conversations in a, in a um, sort of a casual form. We're going to start with Richard Pegg, who is the curator and director of the M McLean uh, Collection of Asian Art and Maps in Chicago. And he's going to address the topic of Nanga and Ming Chinese painting, Sikaki Hakusen and Sheng Mao Ye. Um, Pegg is the author of, of seven books and two dozen articles, uh, primarily on the visual arts of East Asia. And his graduate work was in Chinese and Japanese languages and literature. Um, Richard will be followed by Patricia Graham, who's an adjunct research associate at the University of Kansas Center for East Asian Studies. And um, her talk is entitled, Immigrant Chinese Chan Monks of the Obaku Zen Sect and Their Role in Transmitting Chinese Literati Culture to Japan. So she's going to explore various types of material culture associated with Chinese literati brought to Japan by these well-educated uh, well immigrant Chinese monks. Um, she is a former professor and museum curator. She's now a consultant and certified appraiser of Asian arts. Uh, she is the author of Tea of the Sages, the Art of Sencha, uh, Faith and Power in Japanese Buddhist Art from 1600 to 2005, and Japanese Design, Art, Aesthetics, and Culture. And then our final speaker is Felice Fisher, the distinguished Luther W. Brady Curator of Japanese Art and Senior Curator of East Asian Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And her presentation will be entitled Hyakusen's Hut, Images of the Recluse. Um, she writes, literary ideals of solitary retreat look to Chinese and Japanese sources. Hyakusen often found visual and literary inspiration in Japanese painting and poetry of the past for his images of the recluse in his hermitage. In turn, inspiring, um, uh, inspiring his successors like uh, Ike Taiga and Yosa Busan. Uh, Fisher has organized numerous exhibitions, including Ike Taiga and uh, Tokuyama uh, Gyokuran, Japanese Masters of the Brush, Munakata Shiko, Japanese Master of, of the Modern Print, the Arts of Hanami Koetsu, Japanese Renaissance Master, and on and on and on and on. So she is <laughs> she's a very distinguished scholar, and in 2013, Fisher was named to Japan's Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Rays, in recognition of her contribution to cultural exchange in the field of art. So we'll begin now with um, Richard Pegg's presentation. Uh, please welcome Richard to the podium. Somebody's going to come down and set up here. I believe somebody's going to come down. Yep, here yep, she comes. Yeah. Uh, well, thank. Start off with uh, thank you to Julia and to Sherry for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to talk uh, briefly to you today. Shang Mao Ye was the focus of my dissertation. So he's somebody that I have. No, how do we go to screen? See, I put it on a white ground so people could see this. Um, so uh, it's actually a topic that uh, I've spent quite a bit of time with. I don't have a lot of time uh, today, however. So there's a couple of questions, pretty straightforward, that I'd like to introduce, and uh, hopefully I can cover in my, in my allotted time. Who was Shang Mao Ye? Um, how did so much of his work get to Japan? And uh, what is this relationship between Shang in particular uh, and, and Hyakusen? So we begin with uh, an introduction of Shang Mao Ye's sort of standard 
Uh, he liked to work in lots of formats. We see the fantastic, uh, enormous hand scroll that's uh, on view. Uh, but he did quite a number of paintings that were in the fan and album format. Small, uh, I would characterize his painting style as atmospheric. He liked times of day, changes of seasons, misty landscapes, a uh, very temporal quality uh, to the kind of work that, uh, and kind of a layering of brushwork where you see sort of a dark foreground and it sort of disappears and fades in and out as you go into the, as it re sort of recedes into space. And so this set of, four, of six album leaves that are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art are a really good example to start with. Another characteristic of Sheng's work is the relationship between Tang Dynasty poetry specifically uh, and his own work. And almost every one of his paintings has a single line or a couplet from a Tang poem. And so this relationship, and if we keep in mind what's happening, this is the late Ming period when he's active, uh, the Wanli period from about 1600, let's say, to the 1630s when he's most active, um, we have an enormous resurgence of interest in literature, in Tang poetry, the Gong'an artists, the former and latter uh, seven masters, etc. There's a lot of thinking about classical Chinese poetry. There's lots of woodblock printed books being produced of uh, illustrations of Tang poetry. So there's this great sort of interest that's happening and Sheng plays to that. He's a professional artist. He's working for an audience. So a little bit of Tang poetry, a little uh, atmospheric painting put together and you've got something that's sexy enough to sell um, and interesting enough for a whole range of audience types. So invariably, it's just a single line and as an educated person, and he's working in the city of Suzhou, uh, he would be interested in sort of targeting that kind of audience. So he would take a line that would be recognizable, and you'd know the whole poem. So in this case, I've pulled up uh, one of the album leaves that's uh, in the Mets collection, a Wen Ting Yun. This is a very well-known uh, uh, poem. And the line he inscribes, I've given to you in bold letters. So the most concrete image in the poem can be transferred, and this is his link between the two. So you would see this line, and you'd look at the scene, and you'd remember the poem, and you'd sort of say the poem to yourself, and you'd realize that there's this relationship, there's this complex interaction between the text and the image, and it's this play which is uh, quintessentially Chinese in, in lots of different ways. What's unique about Sheng, and something that he's working within at this time, is, and I've given you a little description here, he creates in sets of album leaves something that I've coined Jiju Hua, which means collected lines painting. So uh, 12th century, Wang Anshu, very well-known statesman, he's put in jail, and while he's in jail, He's memorized all of Du Fu's poems, and he starts putting together new poems using the lines from Du Fu's poems. And he call, calls this collected lines poetry. This kind of poetic structure is reintroduced again in the Wanli period. I've already told you that there's this great interest in Tang poetry. For example, 1598, the Peony Pavilion, the end of every scene is a quatrain four lines from four different Tang poems. That's every single scene in the Peony Pavilion. 100 chapters, 100 scenes, that's 100 quatrain poems. It's a very pedantic kind of thing to do. You have to really know your Tang poetry, the Chuan Tang Shi, the collected Tang poems, to really get it. Um, but it's the kind of intellectual construct that's very appealing. This is exactly, this is exactly what Sheng Maya is constructing in the same way. And so the set of six album leaves that you see, these are the six poems associated with those six album leaves. And you see I've put in bold letters again the six lines that are actually inscribed on the paintings themselves. In this case, once you recognize 
the six poems, you realize that the entire album leaf has a structure. It's about retirement. All of these are related to going into retirement, being in retirement, a friend visiting you in retirement. But it's until you recognize the whole structure. So all you're given is a single scene, a single line of Tong poetry. You have to extrapolate the original poem, string those poems together, you realize that this is kind of multi-layered, it's a very complex construct that's being made. This is the kind of thing that Shang Maya was making. And so the beginning of the Edo period, early 17th century Japan, we have this sort of a new period of stabilization. The kinds of things, Japanese are always sort of crazy for things Chinese. The next question that I want to address is, how did these paintings get to Japan? There's one person in the audience will be very happy to see these screens again. That's Felice. So I don't know, about a year and a half ago, I, I'm going to claim I rediscovered this pair of screens. Uh, what you're looking at is a pair of Red Seal ships. This is the only known pair of screens of Red Seal ships under sail, known in the world. They've been in Philadelphia since the 1890s. Uh, went to two sisters, one gave one in 1938 and the other 1950 something. Um, and uh, I've been doing, some of you familiar, I came out just recently with an article discussing this on Red Seal Ships in Orientations Magazine in the June issue. So it's a topic that I had been thinking about. Uh, but the Red Seal ship system was in place from early 1600 to the middle of the 1630s, the exact period that Shang Maoye, a professional artist, is producing work for an audience. Japanese have uh, uh, official government per permission to trade. You're given a license, which is not for the ship specifically. It's given to a ship's captain. It can be for any ship. But there's very active trade going from Japan to China. It's not that this ever stops, but in this particular period when Sheng was active, this is exactly the time that the Red Seal system was in place. And so these types of ships, which are actually hybrid uh, Western European uh, Chinese style junks, the Western part is the sails, the white sails, the cloth sails, the top sails, and the fore sails that you see with traditional Chinese style main sails. Um, and so this is how this group of paintings uh, are able to get immediate access to a Japanese audience, very keenly interested in things Chinese, Chinese poetry, Chinese painting, uh, sets of albums, exactly the kind of thing that's very sexy uh, to a Japanese audience. In fact, there are more Shang Maoya paintings in Japan still than anywhere else. So that gets us to Hyakusen. Um, what is it about Hyakusen in particular and his relationship with Shang Maoye? And other speakers today will, will help tie this all together. I pull up one example of what's known as a haiga painting, a haiku poem in the top, and a very simple sort of Zen-esque uh, painting in the bottom, this long, thin format. But specifically, what I'm interested in evoking for you is this relationship of classical poetry and painting, exactly the kind of thing that Shang Maoye was doing and making available in Japan in the 17th century. Yes, Hyakusen lives 100 years later, and so Shang Maoye paintings are fairly ubiquitous, I would say, at the time. Um, and it's not surprising to me that someone who's interested in classical uh, poetry and classical painting would be drawn to someone like Shang Maoye, a Chinese painter who draws on, on both of those two themes. So this particular screen's already been introduced to you. This is in the Tokyo National Museum. Um, it would have been fantastic if it could have come, um, but it didn't. And so this pair of screens, as already mentioned, uh, one screen, the right screen that you're looking at here, uh, I've blown up a uh, detail of the inscription, it tells you right on there, it is Fang in imitation of Shang Maoye, first four characters. So there's no question that 
um, Hyakusen had direct access and looked directly at Chinese paintings. And hopefully, in the next six or seven slides, I can convince you uh, uh, to agree with me in that capacity. Uh, but this is a fantastic screen. It's considered an important cultural property. So uh, it's recognized as one of the most important uh, works by Hyakusen in Japan. So I wanted to do kind of a breakdown of specifically the relationship between Sheng and Hyakusen. <coughs> so you see on the left the, the same poem, uh, the detail of the, the line of Tang poetry and Sheng's signature on the left. On the right, you see the inscription on the screen that you were just looking at uh, by Hyakusen. Without going into too much detail, I think if we begin to look at the calligraphic styles of the two artists, the kind of thick, thin, rapid, uh, the same kinds of things, uh, the same kind of loopy, kind of relaxed, it's not quite cursive, but sort of semi-cursive uh, style of calligraphy, I would say that one could easily argue that there's a very close relationship. And not to necessarily say that Hyakusen only based his calligraphic style on Sheng, but it's not outside of the realm of possibility. He certainly saw them, uh, and I think juxtaposing these two together is fairly compelling in uh, providing that uh, comparison. So the other screen uh, is the one by Tang Yin, and I give you, again, the, the blow up of the inscription in the top left corner. Uh, you look at the two and um, you don't necessarily, it has kind of a Chinese-esque, but it's very much within Hyakusen's style. We have the fantastic opportunity to go from these discussions today out to actually look at some of the paintings. And if you were to sort of keep in mind some of the brushwork, the composition, the constructions of the rock masses, the types of trees, these are exactly the same kinds of things that you'll see in the fantastic uh, pair of restored screens that are out uh, on view now. So let's talk a little bit about the painting styles. And so, again, I've juxtaposed two details. Uh, on the left is Hyakusen from that left screen, the Tang Yin style. Uh, and on the right is uh, the screen, is the, the album leaf that we're looking at from Sheng. So Sheng Maoye does, for his trees in particular, a kind of two-layered effect. He has this kind of greenish, bluish wash that he likes for the foliage, and then he does this kind of texturing over it. Sometimes it's ax cut, sometimes it's little triangles, sometimes it's circles, loops, uh, but you definitely get a sense of the kinds of textures of different kinds of leaves, and this kind of two-layer effect, where in the foreground, as you see here on the, on the right, you have this very dark colored, the wash, the texturing of the trees, and then it kind of softens and you get a kind of misty, atmospheric change that happens to the architecture that sits behind it. If you look at what Hyakusen has done, he's done the same kind of wash for the foliage with another kind of texturing. Granted, they're not the same kinds of trees and the same kind of texturing, but that same kind of technique of building up those two layers, and that's in your foreground, and as you start to go into the distant ground, in this case, he adds, in fact, a little sweep of uh, clouds or mist, fog that's going through there, again evoking this idea of atmosphere, of a change of season, of a moment in time that's, uh, that's being captured uh, in the image. And as predicted by Julia, so far she's batting a thousand as far as, as my talk is concerned, uh, this hand scroll that's in uh, Ann Arbor at the University Museum's collection, uh, possibly, I might argue, Sheng Maoye's best work, uh, technically uh, done in the 1620s. He's in his prime, born 1575, 1580, something like that. Um, and so this is sort of the height of his career. This is a painting that uh, was acquired directly out of Japan in the 1950s. So we know it was in Japan. My guess is it went, uh, like many of Sheng's paintings, on a Red Seal ship to uh, Japan. 
1620s, 1630s, uh, immediately the kind of thing. It's a very Chinese theme, um, uh, a very well-known theme, beautifully executed, professional artist, um, a wonderful example. And um, to extend what Julia had to say, I would argue that, and you see that I've pulled up, you didn't give me a pointer, but I, I'm going to, you can still hear me? Or do I need to be on here for video? Or, okay, the camera will follow me around. If you look specifically at this tree right here and the root system, this kind of curve, this little branch that comes down where it's gripping the rock, the curve of it, the way the, the tree spreads, and you look at the tree in the Yakusen's painting, I don't know, it seems pretty much like exactly that he was looking at this specific tree. And this pair of trees that you see right here. So he's pulled from Sheng Maoye's hand scroll and integrated it into a larger format and rearranged some of the other details. Including, and again, here's the same kind of juxtaposition. So here's Sheng's painting. We have two scholars and an attendant, or two scholars and someone else crossing a wooden bridge in Hyakusen, it's two scholars over a stone bridge. But you'll notice that the forward figure, the way they're walking, the way they have their hands, the way the drapery falls, all of these things, again, this seems to be a very specific example of looking specifically at Chung's painting and integrating it into your own version. Uh, the set that's on the right, in particular, you'll notice this little guy in blue and white on the top right, looks like a small figurine, he's round, so he's sitting hunched with his, his robe over. You'll notice that Hyakusen has exactly that same figure in the top right. Uh, um. So that's all the time that I'm, uh, I've been given. Hopefully, hopefully I've been able to convince you that there is a very specific relationship between Shang Maoye and Hyakusen. Thank you very much. to me, you didn't show me how to change slides. What do I do? Um, just these arrows. Oh, okay. Just right or left. All right, thanks. All right, thank you, Julia and Sherry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm very excited to um, be able to see this Nanga exhibition. There have not been Nanga exhibitions in the US for a long time. There are Edo painting exhibitions, collections that are broader in scope, but to focus on this, and especially looking at the interrelationship between um, Chinese painting and its transmission uh, to Japan, I think is a really important achievement here and very, uh, very timely. So, um, this talk is a very brief introduction to Chinese literary, literati culture brought to Japan by emigrant Chinese monks in the mid 17th century. Uh, from 1635, foreigners in Japan, just right after the period Richard was talking about, were largely confined to the southern port city of Nagasaki until Yokohama became a treaty port in 1859. So Nagasaki was very, very important. Um, the most numerous Nagasaki residents were Chinese, mainly merchants, and the Buddhist priests who ministered to them. In the 1620s, before they were confined to Nagasaki, but they were very numerous then too, um, there were two and three, between two and 3,000 uh, Chinese uh, people in residence in Nagasaki, and it swelled to about 10,000 persons by the end of the century. To meet the spiritual needs for four Chinese Buddhist temples were established in Nagasaki. The first in 1623 was Kofukuji, and all the Chinese Nagasaki temples eventually came under uh, the Obaku sect jurisdiction. Sofukuji, which I'm showing you here, is the best preserved. Like the others, its buildings resembled uh, late Ming temples of Fujian, southern Chinese province where most of the merchants and monks came from. 
1654, the Chinese Chan master Ingan, his Chinese name is Yin Yuan, uh, left his exalted position as abbot of the historic Wan Fu Se temple on Mount Huangpo in Fujian to journey to Nagasaki together with some 20 disciples, 10 artisans and assistants. In Japan, he founded the Nagas in Japan, he founded a new Zen lineage, Obaku. Ingen and his sex presence in Japan affected not only Japan's Zen establishment, um, but also practices in other sects and diverse aspects of Japanese intellectual and artistic life and popular culture outside the religious sphere up to the present. Ingen initially intended to remain in Japan for only three years, but he wound up staying for the duration of his life. Ingen lived in tumultuous times of turmoil within China and just several decades after the Tokugawa shoguns came to power. Part of the Tokugawa strategy for control was a strict limit on trade with China and prohibiting of the country's citizens from foreign travel. Nevertheless, they actively promoted Chinese philosophical studies uh, centered on Confucianism, which they adopted as their moral code because they believed it could effectively facilitate transformation of the, countries, of the country from a military uh, dictatorship to a civil bureaucracy. Confucianism carefully outlined the roles and responsibilities of each person's function in society and clarified the responsibility of the rulers as well. By the 17th century, private Confucian, by the late 17th century, private Confucian academies had begun to appear all over Japan that welcomed students from all classes of society and taught various interpretations of Confucian values. Many of these were located in Kyoto, where Hyakusen lived, and many intellectuals who were interested in Chinese culture congregated. Many of these schools also encourage broader uh, curiosity about various aspects of Chinese culture, including the pictorial and literary arts, as well as their underlying philosophies associated with the Chinese literati. Because Ingen was both an, illust an illustrious cleric and well-educated Chinese literatus, the Tokugawa government granted him special permission to leave Nagasaki. In 1655, he moved into a temple near Osaka, where he served as abbot temporarily, and then he relocated to his new sex headquarters of Mampukuchi, which is the Japanese pronunciation for his Fujian temple Wanfu Se, and he moved to Uji. Uh, this temple is located in Uji, south of Kyoto. Mampukuchi Mampukuji officially opened in 1663, although construction lasted until 1693. Many of the buildings post-date Ingen's time, but he provided the vision and the planning. Mampukuji's location near Kyoto, where numerous scholars of Confucian studies resided, resided, enabled it to become an important conduit for Japanese intellectuals to understand Chinese religious and secular intellectual culture. Buildings were constructed of exotic imported teak wood in the style of southern uh, Chinese temples from Fujian. The main hall features statues of Rakan or Arhats by a Chinese sculptor who came to Japan, who died actually tragically quite young uh, after he returned to China and wanted to come back to Japan. He died in transit. Uh, he wasn't allowed to enter Japan at that time. Um, also reinforcing close ties to China up to 1740, all of Mampukuji's abbots were Chinese born. Although Ingen retired in 1664, soon after the temple opened, he remained influential until his death 10 years later. During the heyday of Obaku in the 18th century, approximately 500 Obaku affiliate temples were scattered throughout Japan, and one account indicates as many as 1,240 
um, religious institutions of Obaku heritage, uh, including subtemples, existed as late as 1822. Today, there are about 400 uh, surviving. Ingen was born into an impoverished literati family. His father had failed to pass civil service exams, became a farmer, and then disappeared when Ingen was a child. Nevertheless, he instilled in Ingen the value of a literati in education, which Ingen undertook largely through his own efforts. As part of his studies, he learned and became famous in the arts of Taoist divination, which he was very famous for in Japan. His studiousness and innate talent uh, led to his later accomplishments in calligraphy and poetry. There are some 3,000 verses known by Ingen today, preserved at Mampukuji in printed books. Much calligraphy by Ingen uh, exists today at Mampukuji and other Obeku temples, many also collected by private individuals. You can see a few pieces, one piece by him in the exhibition in this museum today. Um, um, and there, there, many of them are all over. He was so popular, there are also lots of forgeries of his works, unfortunately. Um, soon after Ingen died in 1673, uh, his possessions carefully cataloged in a list still preserved at Mount Pukuji included a large book collection. Although Chinese ships regularly imported Chinese books in the early Edo period, this carefully assembled collection stands out because of its association with Ingen, who was highly respected by the Japanese. These volumes include many now rare Ming period editions of Chan texts and 61 volumes on Chinese philosophy, history, calligraphy, and literature. Particularly noteworthy are books on classical poetry, including the collected works of the Sixth Dynasty's recluse poet Tao Yuan Ming, the collected works of the Confucian Ming Dynasty's um, re dynasty reformist Wang Yang Ming, Taoist philosophical writings, uh, including two seminal texts, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching and Master Zhuang's uh, Zhu uh, Zhuangzi on lineages of Taoist immortals. And also the, uh, the Jia Qing, the classic of tea by the Tang Dynasty literati scholar recluse Lu Yu. The diversity of these titles is astonishing and reflects Ingen's literati interests that he also encouraged his monks to pursue. Mo Kuan, um, whose work I'm showing you here and some others, um, was one of uh, many of the Obaku monks who recorded enlightenment experiences in poetry, which had long been an important part of the Chan and Zen uh, cultural practices for centuries. And Ingen's library assured his monks uh, would be able to know the basic texts on Chinese poetry and study them as an, this, so they would understand this important form of spiritual expression. However, in Ingen's monastic codes of the Obaku sect, he wrote, he would allow his monks to read widely and practice literati arts only after mastering Obaku teachings and only if their meditations would not be affected. This painting of literati plants at left by Mongkuan, who, who, who was the second um, abbot at Mampukuji, he was also an emigrant monk who came to Japan. The 1673 uh, list uh, of Ingen's possessions also included many paintings. Some he brought with him, others were obtained from followers who came over later, and still others he commissioned from artists that never came to Japan, but had the paintings have been sent to him. The most important of this latter type was the monk painter uh, Chun Xian. One album depicts uh, 18 kanon, it's dated um, 16, uh, 36. The most uh, famous older 
Buddhist painting that Ingen brought with him, portrays 500 rakan or arhats, saints of the Buddha, basically, and it's signed by a Yuan dynasty figure painter, Wang Zhengpeng. In his day, it was considered genuine. Now scholars believe it's a faithful copy. Ingen presented this scroll to the shogun, uh, Tokugawa Ietsuna, as a gift during an audience in 1658 in Tokyo. When Mampukuji opened, the shogun returned it to Ingen, who attached a colophon to it dated 1661, describing the circumstances of the painting's return. Wang's painting inspired the illustrious artist um, Literat literati artist uh, E.K. Taiga, about whom we're going to hear more later, who um, visited Mampukuji and who painted these wall paintings for Mampukuji. Ingen also owns some secular paintings and calligraphy, most of those on the 1673 in inventory are by little known artists and scholars from Fujian, but one calligraphy fan from a group is by the illustrious Ming literati painter theoretician uh, Dong Chi Chang. Clearly the best Chinese works that Ingen owned were those by Chan Buddhist artists of his own time, especially works by Chen Xin and also Itsunen, um, who was another person who came to Nagasaki from China, originally as a merchant in 1643, and was ordained as a Chan monk of Ingen's lineage 10 years later. And he was also a prolific painter and teacher of painting in Nagasaki. It was Itsunen who put, petitioned Ingen to come to Japan in the first place. Ingen is also regarded as the progenitor of a formal secular Japanese tea ceremony for sencha, which is unfermented steeped green leaf tea. Um, techniques for processing sencha had only been perfected in China in the 16th century, where they quickly became popular and replaced the older custom of drinking powdered tea, which continued to be used in Japan for cha no yu. Following its widespread adoption in China, sencha entered Japan via Chinese residents of Nagasaki, but the beverage was only available in limited quantities in Japan until 1638 when it was first successfully uh, domestically processed after Chinese uh, varieties had become too expensive. Ever since Liu Yu had written his 8th century classic of tea, which as I mentioned was one of the books linked in Ingen's library, the beverage had been closely identified with the Chinese literati as well as with Chan Buddhist monks whose spiritual values incorporated literati ideals. Ingen's followers actually were responsible for the first reprinting of this classic of tea in Japan. Chan liturgical practices of the Ming dynasty to which Ingen adhered incorporated the service of sencha, which he and his monks also drank at less formal assemblies. Sencha was also a subject for meditation in Zen koan. And in addition, both Chinese Chan monks and literati composed thousands of verses about tea, as did the Obaku monks. Ingen's secular writings include many poems about sencha. Sencha did not evolve into a secular tea ceremony rivaling Chanoyu until well after Ingen's time. The person credited with its creation, Ko Yugai, or Bai Sao, the old tea seller, was a Japanese born Obaku monk who had trained at Mampukuji but left the priesthood to become an itinerant seller of sencha at various famous locales throughout Kyoto, describing his poetry. Uh, as, uh, and he described tea in his own poetry as the elixir of the sages. The most striking portraits of him were brushed by one of his uh, painter friends, uh, the eccentric artist Ito Jakuchu, who was also a lay practitioner of Obaku. Baisao dispensed sencha in his own Chinese tea wares that you see here. Hyakusen had befriended um, Bai Sao in 1645, and he brushed Bai Sao's portrait at least twice. One of the versions, uh, at the one it left, is in this exhibition. And Taiga was also among Bai Sao's large coterie of, of admirers. 
Um, Japanese fans of Chinese culture associated Senchao with Chinese literati culture, which they understood to be permeated by the spirit of seifu, pure elegance. Bai Sao hung a banner by his tea stall with this word on it. He used the term interchangeably with another word, fudiu, blowing with the wind, literally, and a Chinese, originally a Chinese term known in Japan for centuries that had many different meanings over the centuries and depending on the, um, the context. Originally, it connoted a courtly elegance and refinement. You see it also listed um, in inscriptions on lots of ukiyo-e prints. In connection with sencha, the meaning of seifu or fudiu implied a deep understanding of Chinese literary culture, avocation of its tenets of ermatic withdrawal from the world, and devotion to simple pleasures, appreciation of nature, and participation in literati pastimes, pastimes like composing poetry, brushing paintings of imaginary Chinese mountains, and celebrated literary gatherings, and so forth. Some of Hyakusen's paintings reveal his appreciation for these literati values, as did, of course, paintings by Taigen, and Felice is going to talk more about this later. The, influ the influential Kyoto haikai poet, Matsuo Basho, also wrote about fudiu, which he learned from studying Chinese Taoist texts. Hyakusen, too, must have gained understanding of fudiu through his participation in haikai circles. In one of his haiga paintings, he featured a Chinese scholar sleeping at his desk. The accompanying poem illuminates the subject, first dream of the year, even though I become a butterfly, I'm still cold. The poem references a famous passage in the seminal Taoist text in Ingen's library that describes how Master Zhuang dreamt he was a butterfly, but upon waking, he did not know if he was a human having a dream or a butterfly dreaming he was Zhuang. Appreciation of Chinese painting and literati values was closely tied to participation in Sencha gatherings. A Chinese ambience always permeated its tea rooms, and gatherings often featured special rooms for display of Chinese paintings. One of the most celebrated was by the Ming literati painter Yang Wenzong a painting that Hyakusum himself had copied. It was later owned by the Nanga painter Yamamoto Baitsu and can be seen in this sketch of Baitsu's Sencha tea room much later by Tomioka Tesai. Thank you. I would like to thank Julia and the director here at Bamfa for inviting me to uh, participate in this project following the pioneering footsteps of the late great Professor James Cahill, who really did discover Sakaki Hyakusen and his significance to Japanese Nanga culture. And it's been a privilege and a pleasure to work with Jim's very talented successor, Julia White, and her team here at MAMFA. And thank you all for attending today, and instead of going to the Bluegrass Festival or to the beach. <laughs> I would like to um, bring Hyakusen back to Japan, now that you've heard how much he was influenced by China. And so I've entitled my talk, Hyakusen's Hut, Images of the Recluse. Here, of course, is a, the detail again of Hyakusen's major work, which has recently be, been conserved to its ethereal shimmering beauty by uh, Kawazu-sensei. Here, Hyakusen gives us a view of a Chinese-style uh, retreat, impressive pavilions among lofty mountains or riversides. And 
These screens date to the latter part of Hyakusen's all too short career. His earliest known dated painting is of 1720, which also depicts a mountain landscape. Reading in a Hermitage is the title. It's no longer extant, um, <clears throat> but the Tokyo National Research Institute for Cultural Properties of Tobunken luckily has preserved black and white photographs from a 1939 exhibition of Hyakusen's work. Um, and this exhibition was held at the Bijutsuken Kyujo, which is the predecessor to the Tobunken. It was among dozens of works that were collected by a man named Sasaki Masaoki. And Sasaki had the interesting goal uh, in his collecting to have at least 100 paintings by Hyakusen. The first character who, of whose name, Hyaku, means 100. Sadly, much of the collection was destroyed by fire, uh, although we know that the screens from the, that are now in the Tokyo National Museum that you've seen uh, did survive from the, that collection. But the loss of so many works by Hyakusen, unlike Taiga and Busan's, may be one of the reasons that Hyakusen did not come to the attention of collectors. Um, and I think this, uh, the last exhibition of Hyakusen's works was actually in 1984 at the Nagoya City Museum. So I really um, want to emphasize the importance of this show uh, that Julia put together to really re instate Hyakusen in his proper place in the Nanga tradition. And I know Japanese scholars are very interested and will be coming to see the exhibition. This first um, image also shows uh, a recluse in his mountain hut with books and a waterfall in the background. Not quite solitary, because he has that servant in the background, in the foreground there, uh, sweeping. And as we've seen and heard uh, from Richard, uh, it may be that he was looking, in part, at some of the uh, Wang Wangai uh, landscapes from the mustard seed garden printed manual. And you see, there's a servant in the lower left there, also sweeping, and may have inspired Hyakusen's composition. And a similar compositional type continues uh, on the right in Yokoi Kinkogu's version, which is in the exhibition, although his seems closer to the Hyakusen than the uh, Wangai. And the sweeping servant is actually, has traded in his broom for a fishing net and is uh, probably preparing to get some sashimi for the, to go with the wine that uh, the recluse has in his hut. Chinese influences were, of course, not new to Japan. They began with the introduction of Buddhism in the sixth century. And in addition to the Chinese printed and painted sources, Hyakusen's receptivity and his generation to literati Painting motifs such as the recluse in his hut also owes much to the literary sources long available within Japanese cultural tradition, with which Hyakusen himself, as we have heard, a poet of the 17 syllable haiku format, would have been familiar. So, in this talk related to hinges between China and Japan, I would like to touch on some of the Japanese sources that helped create this atmosphere among 18th century Japanese artists and made them receptive to the Chinese visual images of the recluse in his hermitage. Among Sorry, I seem to hear. Among um, Buddhist exemplars from the Chinese tradition, Indian and Chinese Buddhist tradition, was uh, Vimalakirti, 
the layman of the fifth or sixth century BC, who built a stone hut for his retreat, here in an image by the Japanese Zen monk Ikkyu Sojun, done in uh, 1462. He's showing him with a disciple or a visitor, uh, perhaps discussing Buddhist uh, doctrine. But this sort of image of the wise man in his retreat, whether uh, Taoist or Buddhist, became a literary trope in Japan as well. Two centuries before Ikkyu, another Buddhist layman, Kamo no Chomei, who lived from 1153 to 1216, wrote an essay called An Account of My Hut, Hojoki, in 1212, describing a hermitage he built in the foothills of Mount Hino in Toyama, near Kyoto. On the left is a recreation of Chomei's hut at Shimogamo Shrine in Kyoto. Chomei's account begins, the flow of the river is ceaseless, and its water is never the same. The bubbles that float in pools, now vanishing, now forming, are not of long duration. So in the world are man and his dwelling. The, this, these translations are by Donald Keane. In his account, Chomei also makes reference to Vimalakirti, and Chomei himself witnessed many natural and man-made disasters in his lifetime, and his outlook is tinged with Buddhist ideas of ephemerality and transience. He asks, for whose benefit does man torment himself in building houses at last but a moment? For what reason is his eye delighted by them? Many things led me to live in seclusion, he says, as he builds gradually smaller and smaller dwellings until his 60th year when he erected this 10-foot square final home. He says, it is a hut where perhaps a traveler might spend a single night, which it is a bare 10-foot square and less than seven feet high. I have built a little shelf on which I keep three or four black leather baskets that contain books of poetry and music and extracts from the sacred writings. Each season brings its comfort, even winter. And the fan painting on the right is by a 20th century literati, uh, Kosugi Hoan, uh, as he imagines uh, Kamo no Chomei in his 10-foot square hut. Perhaps Hyakusen's hut in winter in the show was inspired by Chomei's account. He says, in winter, I look with deep emotion on the snow piling up and melting away. Although Hyakusen's recluse seems safely ensconced away from the window. Um, and Chomei's near contemporary, the poet Saigyo, was more optimistic about the seasons in his winter hut poem. He says, how timely the delight of the snowfall obliterating the mountain trails just when I wanted to be alone. Saigyo's poetry was well known and regarded by later generations such as Hyakusen. In Saigyo's poem collection, Poems of a Mountain Home, Sankashu, he describes himself in his reclusion. The loneliness of my ramshackle grass hut where no one but the wind comes to call. Hyakusen's recluse here seems to be longing for a friend coming to call as well. Another literary precursor of Hyakusen's in Japanese culture was Yoshida Kenko, the author of Essays in Idleness, Tsure Zuregusa, written in 1340, who notes, the appearance of a house is in some sort an index to the character of its occupant. He describes the ideal Threading my way down a narrow, moss-grown path, I come upon a lonely hut. There was never a sound to greet me save the dripping of water from a pipe buried in fallen leaves. But I knew someone lived there, for sprays of chrysanthemum and maple leaf bestrewed the shelf on the shrine. Ah, I thought, in such a place a man can spend his days, to sit alone in the lamplight with a book spread out before you and hold infant, intimate converse with men of unseen generations. Such is a pleasure beyond compare. Kenko's reclusion was not like Chomei's, brought on by disasters all around, and nor by 
um, political circumstances, as was the case in some uh, Chinese recluse uh, literature, but it was an aesthetic lifestyle choice. Yosa Busan, who admired Hyakusen's work, as we know, painted a version in this exhibition that shows a visitor approaching by boat and the recluse in his hut, ready to receive him with what looks like a sencha uh, set out, anticipating an afternoon of conversation and conviviality. Another artist of the next generation influenced by Hyakusen was Ike Taiga, who's enjoying a moon in a riverside cottage, depicts the ideal of such companionship in an album leaf size image. The poem reads, beneath the eaves on mat in pure breeze, below the pines, a cup in moonlight, the joy of seclusion are just this way, and even better now a friend's in sight. One thing all three of these artists, Hyakusen, Busan, and Taiga, had in common was the admiration for the great poet Matsuo Basho, 1644 to 1694, so the century before theirs, another key figure in the literature of the recluse. They looked to Basho for his Japanese poetry in the 17-syllable haiku or haikai form, and as an originator of the haiga, the combination of haiku and painting, and as an exemplar of the traveler's life. Busan, in particular, was inspired to copy out and illustrate Basho's most famous travelogue, the Oku no Hosomichi, Narrow Road to the North, in many formats, and we have two beautiful fan paintings in the show. The Okonohoso Michi records a three-year journey that Basho under undertook in 1689, heading to the north. He was in part himself following in the footsteps of the 12th century poet mentioned earlier, Saigo, to whom Basho alludes in this scene early in his travels north, where he visited a priest living in a thatched hut flanked by a large chestnut tree, and the tree reminded Basho of Saigyo's verse about picking up fallen chestnuts, and what he was moved to compose his own poem, which Busan brushed as the last line of the text on this fan. Few in this world notice those blossoms, chestnut, by the eaves. Likewise, the monk who occupies this small hut is waiting to be discovered by the occasional visitor. Basho's priest, living in the reclusion, Pratanified the 18th century literati ideal of Iris, like Busan, who also literally traveled Basho's road to the north. Here is their hero, Basho, as depicted by Hyakusen in 1746. This again was uh, is a Tobunken archival photograph. Seated on a straw mat, reminiscent of the type seen in images of the Buddha Shakyamuni during his austere life in self-exile, Basho wrote an account of one of his huts in the hills of Mount Kokubo, Basho's unreal dwelling, Genjuan, during the last years of his life. Basho did not actually build this hut, but occupied one that had been abandoned some years earlier, leaving the hut at the crossroads of unreality, as he says. In this hut, where I live as a hermit, as a passing traveler, there's no need to accumulate household possessions. All I have is a broad-brimmed hat of nettle wood and a rush raincoat, which I hang on a post above my pillow. Or when, as rarely happens, a visitor comes from afar, we sit calmly at night, the moonlight our companion, arguing with our shadows. On the right is another image by Kosugi Hoan, who, like Hyakusen and Busan before him, himself followed in the footsteps of Bacio on his travels to the north in 1927 and published this album in 1932. Somewhere around 1771, Busan and Taiga were commissioned to collaborate on a production of a pair of albums of poems and images called 10 Pleasures and 10 Conveniences of Country Living. Here, the literary reference is to a Chinese 17th century writer, Li Yu, who the tea 
of tea fame and the owner of the Mustard Seed Garden, after which the printed manual was named and for which he wrote the preface. Here, Tyga's recluse is looking out from his hermitage in Convenient for Chanting Poetry. The poem reads, my window shutters with no set purpose open on a mountain view. I need not go in search of poems. Poems come here of themselves. Don't marvel that my purse is poor while I'm rich in poems and verses. It's only since I'm living here in this little paradise. And this translation is by um, Jonathan Chaves, wonderful translator of Chinese poetry. And this album itself belonged to another great Japanese literatus, uh, Kawabata Yasunari. Noro Kaiseki, whose Chinese style landscape is in the exhibition, also sketched his mentor Taiga's hut, seen here on the left, located at the south gate of, Nori, of neighboring Sorinji, where Basho once had his temporary dwelling. Unlike the album painting by Taiga above, he and Gyokuran lived in the heart of Kyoto, where he painted for a living. Ideal meets reality. Taiga and Gyokuran, seen here in the, from the printed Kijinden uh, in their rather cluttered, not so uh, calm hermitage. Lest you think these images of the recluse in his hut are too far removed from our lives and times, let me introduce you to Heidegger's hut built in the mountains of the Black Forest of Germany in 1922. The connection between an 18th century Japanese painter and a 20th century German philosopher is not as far-fetched as it might seem. Kamono Chome's An Account of My Hut was first published in an English translation by Natsume Soseki in 1891. Italian translations also followed, and of course, haiku were much admired by Ezra Pound and the imagist poets. Heidegger wrote <coughs> a, a work called The Thinker as Poet, and he describes in this work the best circumstances for thinking. Quote, when the early morning light quietly grows above the mountains, when through a rent in the rain clouded sky, a ray of sun suddenly glides over the gloom in the meadows, when the mountain brook in night stillness tells of its plunging over the borders. When the winter night snowstorms tear at the cabin and one morning the landscape is hushed in a blanket of snow. In clarity of language not normally associated with this philosopher, <laughs> but perhaps inspired by the style of Cho Mei's translated work. Apparently Heidegger is also familiar with Basho's haiku which were held up as exemplars of imagist brevity. And Heidegger's text here concludes with a haiku-esque rendering of his own. Forests spread, brooks plunge, rocks persist, mist diffuses. In addition, we know that Heidegger had access to Japanese prints in a German private collection, among which was the one on the right by Hishikawa Morunobu. Heidegger is described by one of his visitors he appears like one of those sages painted on one of those folding screens in the Museum of Ethnology in Bremen, which had inspired Heidegger. Each of the sages sitting in front of his hut, meditating and writing, while a cup filled by a, a serving spirit with a refreshing draft from the river that flows by is passed on to them. This uh, Hexen's image on the right of the famed Tang poet Li Bo, is perhaps not quite what Heidegger had in mind. but <laughs> And the final hut to which I would like to introduce you is one associated closer to home, built by a graduate of the University here, Berkeley School of Architecture, Anne Klein. I first met Anne in 1973 when she came to the Philadelphia Museum of Art to look at our tea house in her study of huts. Klein was initially interested in the tea house as a hermitage of sorts. And here she is in a hut that she and her students built uh, in the attic of the rotunda of the School of Architecture at the uh, University of Florida, Ohio, where she taught for many years. 
Klein's reading of Japanese literary works such as Kamo no Chome and his account of the hut moved her to expand her investigations into huts as dwellings, whether permanent or temporary, whether deep in the mountains or in an urban setting. And whether Anne Klein knew of this Hyaksen's recluse painting here at Berkeley, I don't know. But one result of her involvement with huts was a slim volume entitled A Hut of One's Own, published by MIT Press in 2001, which I recommend to you as a meditation on the meaning of the hut and the life of the recluse in our own time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, all three of you wonderful speakers. Uh, we've just been treated to just a really special afternoon of, of uh, looking at our trying to understand better relationships between China and Japan. Um, uh, I just want to thank you all three for, for really wonderful talks um, and invite you to come up to the front, if you would, please. And um, we'll open the floor to questions. Um, i just make a few comments as they're coming forward. Uh, Richard did a wonderful job of, of making that visual connection between uh, Chinese painting of the late Ming period and our Nanga artists. And uh, I'm so glad he was able to bring forward uh, the Orchid Pavilion and a number of other works by Sheng. And, and I know there will be questions about um, that connection uh, probably from the audience. Um, I have some questions about the Red Seal ships and what the um, sort of um, manifest would have held for those uh, particular ships, what, how we know and what we know about those. So that's something I maybe you could address in a minute. Um, and Pat, with her very insightful talk about the Obaku connection, um, really brings forward uh, the idea of um, the, the importance of uh, Buddhism in the transmission of Chinese culture into Japan. And um, I, I'm sure that there are many questions about uh, the connections between what they might have brought with them and what they might have acquired once they uh, were in Japan. And of course, Felice's wonderful poetic uh, um, essay here was, was very, very moving and, and very revealing about the importance of poetry to the Nanga uh, painters. And um, perhaps in some ways, it, it allows us to see a greater insight into the personal individuals uh, that painted these wonderful works. Um, so I'm just going to open the floor to questions. And uh, or if you, if you would like to ask any questions, you can ask them. Sure, I'll come back to that. Thank you. I believe this is on now. OK, thank you. Um, so first of all, um, perhaps, Richard, would you, could you address the, the issue of what those ships were bringing into Japan from China and what kind of evidence we have of uh, the material that might have related to the artistic endeavors of Japan during that time? Um. We're, actually, we're actually doing pretty good on time. We do have a, a limit because there's a film after this program and we have to clear out. But I'd like us to be as um, yeah, informal and, and uh, uh, expansive as you'd like to be. We'll cut you off if it gets mm -hmm. too far. Away. Okay. But you do need to hold the mic right up to your face. Yeah, I got it. Um, where to start? So uh, with the founding of the Edo, the Tokugawa, Rain. Uh, the government decided to regulate maritime trade on an official level. Uh, this is a complicated issue. Uh, maritime trade throughout what we'll call the China Seas, that's the East China Sea, South China Seas, so Southeast Asia, East Asia, uh, has been going on for thousands of years. 
uh, governments of various types have attempted to regulate it, shut it down, open it um, uh, with varying degrees of success. Essentially, we have networks of um, that are comprised of port cities. So in the case of Japan, it was before Nagasaki, it was Hirado. Uh, all along the Chinese coast, Nanjing, Ningbo, Fuzhou, Guangzhou, uh, et cetera. In Manila, in, in Tonkin, in northern Vietnam, uh, the entire Vietnamese coast, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, et cetera. So all of these port cities exist. All of them participate in multiple networks. The Red Seal system is just one example uh, that lasts for about three and a half decades. Uh, when there was official government sponsorship, that doesn't mean that there wasn't trade before and trade after, there was continuous trade. Again, the port cities sort of run autonomously. Whatever the government says they can and can't do, they still operate. Um, the system that's put in place is uh, done very specifically so that the, the new government feels that they have some sense of control as to what's coming in and going out. The kinds of materials that are being traded to answer Julia's question is everything. Uh, cash crops, uh, materials that the Japanese want, uh, the Japanese are sending out certainly pottery. They're sending out weapons. Japanese weapons are in high demand in all of Asia. Uh, Japanese mercenaries attached to those weapons. Uh, once we begin in the Tokugawa period, they're for sale and for hire. Um, the uh, Japanese lacquer is being exported. Japanese, all of the Japanese sort of high-end goods are all being exported and in demand. There's also uh, soft or other kinds of goods. Uh, m some of you may be familiar with the fact that from about the 1520s up until about the 1620s, uh, Japan supplied one third of the world's silver. Uh, most people are unaware of that. We, we have a better understanding of the silver that's emerging from the Spanish American roots coming out of South America and Central America. Uh, but for quite a long time, Japan supplies a third of that. That silver is important in China. Chinese switch in the Ming period from a rice-based tax system to a silver-based tax system, so they need lots of silver. Once a year, a Spanish galleon goes to Manila. We use Manila as our port city for a discussion, uh, and it'll all tie back together. Um, <laughs> So uh, approximately one million ounces a year was coming to Manila from the Americas. That's a lot of silver, no matter how you, how you qualify that. Uh, that silver was brought to Manila. Manila is one of these port cities. It had a Japan town. It had a Chinatown. It had uh, part of the construct of all of these port cities was there were peoples from all of the other port cities located in those places. They intermarry, they act as go-betweens between the local governments, et cetera. So Manila is a nice example because you have a Spanish overlord, uh, if you will, starting from the 1570s onward. Uh, you have a Japantown, you have a Chinatown. So American silver is coming to Manila. Chinese are interested in the silver. Silk is coming from China. And so we have what's called the silk silver route. Also coming through Manila are things like uh, emeralds from Lima, Peru. Those are coming into Manila and participating in, it's the same port city, another network, the Muslim system. So the Mughal courts, which are so keen, Shah Jahan, Jahangir, etc., so keen on having large medallions of emeralds, strings of emeralds, all of this is traveling through the Muslim route, which includes India, which includes much of the Philippines, uh, most of the Indonesian archipelago. And so you have a link from the Americas using emeralds coming to Manila that is then redistributed into another network. All that said, the Red Seal system is also tied into Manila. So you have red seals, licenses, that are issued 
for ship's captains to go from Manila specifically to Japan, to Nagasaki or Harado. The first few decades, it's, it's both. Uh, by the time we get into the late 1620s, it's only Nagasaki and ultimately because of the changes that happen in 1635, Nagasaki becomes the only port of entry for the Chinese for, uh, and for the Dutch. More? Okay. So, so you have the Red Seal system. So you have these licenses that are issued. What are the kinds of things that uh, are of interest from Japan, for example, going to the Philippines? Well, the Spanish who lived there and ran the port that they, they had never or chose never to base their diets on the local rice economy. They wanted flour. The place they got their flour from was Japan. And so here you have a cash crop grown in Japan that's brought specifically to Manila. In addition, that same silver that's going to China because during this time, China has a ban. There's a sea ban. There's no trade with any foreigners allowed in China. That's not to say it didn't exist. All of those port cities that I mentioned along China were still in operation, still trading, but it wasn't officially sanctioned by the government. They were all considered pirates. So a pirate is a very ambiguous kind of term. It depends on your perspective. So the silver that's coming out of Japan is also going to Manila. So we have wheat, we have silver, we have lacquer, we have uh, once the Dutch uh, enter into this whole uh, situation, Batavia, which is the capital they build in 1610, uh, in Indonesia, today's Jakarta, there, importing, exporting from Japan, the kinds of things that the Japanese are interested in importing are hardwoods from Southeast Asia uh, to construct the ships like you saw, the Red Seal ships. So those Red Seal ships, uh, that style of ship is made in every one of these ports all around. Uh, but the things, for example, the keel was, uh, the, best word, uh, the best wood for that was ironwood. Ironwood comes from the Malay Peninsula, primarily. You can get it in other parts, uh, but Thailand in particular is a very good source for that. So all of this, you begin to understand the kind of complexity of these networks that are all based in the port cities, all interconnected, and all running independently of government regulation. So the kinds of things going into Japan from China are Zen monks, Chan monks, as we've seen, uh, uh, Chinese paintings, Chinese ceramics, Chinese every, every high-end good. In addition, we have, uh, we didn't even talk about the exchange of rice and how rice goes from Thailand to southern China, uh, different kinds of rice, different cultures consider other rices from other places exotic, so they want to import those things. All of these from the low-end cash crops to uh, sort of me median household goods, like uh, you maybe have 10 different levels of types of silk, from raw silk to finished silk to gauze to satin to all of the different weaves that you can get, uh, ones that are embroidered, not embroidered, etc. Silk is a very important commodity, Chinese silk to all of these places. So the silk, for example, goes to Manila, and then it goes from Manila back to Japan, or for this very short 35 year period. It can go directly from Nagasaki to Ningbo. They can be importing from Fuzhou, silk directly in. So someone like Sheng Mao Ye, uh, all of these artists that are coming with the Zen monks, et cetera, directly from Japan in this very early part of the 17th century, is a very active period. There is stuff moving constantly in and out. I think during the 35 years of the Red Seal system, uh, 485 permits were uh, given out. 60% of them, um, this is a rough estimate, were Japanese. The rest were, I think 35 of them were for Westerners and the rest were for Chinese captains. And so you have a very active trade system that's in place. Sure. Yeah, that, that really, fills in the picture nicely about the maritime trade. And I know you work a lot in that area, so 
Um, Richard has done a lot of you know, work in mapping, as you may know from some of his articles. So um, it's really interesting uh, how uh, that trade influenced what was going on throughout Asia. It was, uh, there was a very active sort of uh, interaction that we sometimes forget that it even went out into to the um, Middle East and, and, and back through uh, East Asia. Um, I'd, I'd like to just turn to Pat and ask her about the uh, influences that the Obaku monks brought into Japan. Uh, they were based in Fujian, and they were uh, basically um, fleeing a very bad situation in China. And I wonder if you could talk, speak to that a little bit and then perhaps uh, l inform us a little bit more about how much they created in Japan and how much they actually brought from China with them. Uh, I'm particularly curious about the sculptor who made those wonderful sculptures, whether or not he was working in Japan and, and, uh, or bringing things with him. But I don't want to be too broad in my question, but if you could just maybe address some of those okay, issues. OK, I'll s uh, can you all hear me OK? Um, so I'd like to start by um, addressing uh, trade also and ships. And um, uh, in the 1650s, or a little bit after uh, Richard's time, um, one little tiny point I mentioned in my talk was that the, the buildings, many of the buildings at Mapukuchi were made of teak wood. And that's not the type of wood that's usually used for c temple construction in Japan. Um, and the reason it was they were made of teak wood is very curious. Uh, they actually, the wood actually came to Japan um, on a Dutch ship. Um, and originally, uh, Japan was not its destination. Uh, the the sh the uh, the Dutch had an outpost in southern Taiwan, um, and there was an earthquake there. And soon after this earthquake happened, they requested from Jakarta, "Send us wood. Our buildings fell down." You know, and so they dis the the Dutch headquarters in Jakarta dispatched um, envoys, you know, a ship to Thailand to requisition this wood that was supposed to go to Taiwan. But by the time uh, in the months intervening, um, the Taiwanese colony got taken over by a Ming Dynasty uh, rebel um, known in the West as Kaksinga, who was a Ming loyalist. And the Dutch had to flee this Taiwanese colony. So unbeknownst, you know, they didn't have radios or any communications, so unbeknownst to them, the, the, the Dutch ship en route to Taiwan with this wood could not make port there. And also there was a typhoon and they got diverted to Japan. And so the wood ended up in, in Nagasaki, where, um, which is totally fascinating, and it ended up at Mampukuchi because some of Ingen's supporters were uh, merchants from Osaka who were traders with the foreigners in Nagasaki, and they wanted to help um, Ingen, and so they requisitioned this wood. Originally, the Dutch said, oh, well, we'll just send the, sell this to Japan for use there. Well. The Japanese didn't want to use this foreign wood for their construction of their temples and buildings. And this was a period of great reconstruction um, uh, during the Tokugawa heyday of, of affluence in the middle of the 17th century. So anyhow, so that's how um, they got this wood. Um, so there's this huge international network, and sometimes it's in, you know, intentional, and sometimes it's a byproduct. And Ingen didn't mind this foreign wood, um, and for various reasons I can't really go into here. So what was the rest of your question? <laughs> I, I got distracted. <laughs> um, so uh, what the the. Obaku monks were bringing with so, them. So, okay, oh yeah, and the, and the <laughs> sculptor. Hondo say, um, um, what would the in Japanese pronunciation of name was this young man who came with Ingen, and um, he tragically died in the 19, in, in his 30s, 
Um, his father was an associate of, of Ingen, knew Ingen, and was a sculptor and artist of Buddhist um, uh, materials, and had settled, uh, had fled um, uh, China and settled in Vietnam. There was another Chinese outpost in Vietnam. And so um, Han Dose came to Japan and started making sculptures for all of the Obaku temples. Um, many of his statues at Mampukuji are surviving and they're very important. He was incredibly talented. And then he went back to Vietnam to visit his father um, and by the and for his father's uh, 70th birthday, and then when he came back to try to get back into Japan to continue his work in Japan, he was stopped in immigration. And horribly, this sounds familiar. Um, and he never made it to Japan and died of illness in uh, in transit. Basically, uh, is what happened. Um, and. Um, but there were, you know, Ingen brought craftsmen with him, and so some of these people who were the builders of these Chi this Chinese-style temple complex were actually Chinese who came there. And then after um, Han Dose died, there were a number of Kyoto Buddhist sculptors who worked for Mampukuji and who did things in sort of a hybrid Chinese-Japanese style as well. But the main statues, the core of the statues, were all um, Chinese uh, by, this one, by this one young man. Um, and Ingen did bring some um, secular paintings with him, uh, but they were not very good quality, and so, um, in Suzuki Kei's big compendium of uh, Chinese paintings, if you look to the Mampukuji section, you can see which things that group thought were important. Um, and a number of things didn't make that list uh, because they were just inferior. And it makes sense because Ingen himself was not affluent. As I said, he came from a very impoverished literati family. He had some wealthy patrons, but you know, they didn't have the money to bring and um, patronize and collect works by really important Chinese literati painters at that time. So you don't see a lot of high quality literati paintings coming to Japan through Obaku channels. If I can add to the Nagasaki story, um, one thing that we didn't bring out um, is that Hyaksen's family, uh, Julia did mention that they dealt in Chinese medicines in Nagoya in their shop, the Hasendo, the Hall of the Eight Immortals. But they probably had merchants in Nagasaki that they were working with. And there's actually a printed map of 1745 by Hyaksen of Nagasaki. So we think he may also have gone to Nagasaki himself, perhaps as an agent for his family business, and been either exposed to Chinese paintings there or maybe even acquired some. Uh, so there's a very important Nagasaki connection for Hyaksen as well. Right. Um, it's very interesting, um, the different influences that occurred. And I, I, I would like to bring it back to Hyaksen and uh, his own poetry that um, he created, f uh, uh, composed, and, and wrote, and how his uh, work might have influenced the later uh, Nanga painters uh, in their style, both in terms of poetry and in, and in painting, in haiga and haika. Well, Hyaksen literally lived um, a double life that 1720, painting was his first painting in the Chinese Nanga style. And in 1721, he published his first haiku. And he continued his career as a haiku poet. Um, in the tradition, he followed a teacher who was in the school of Basho. And though he, and he published his own sort of eight immortals of poetry was his first haiku collection that he also illustrated. Uh, so he's interested both in the poetry and in the painting part, so creating the haiga in the sort of tradition of uh, Basho. And I think it was very um, 
foresightful, again, of Jim Cahill to collect the Haiga work as well. Um, when you read the uh, essay by Kyoko on the seals, you'll see that Japanese art historians through the 19th century really only recognized Hyakusen as a painter of Nanga, and the seals that were published were only the ones on his Chinese-style paintings. So the new discovery and publication in this uh, catalog that um, Bamfa has put out is very important in tracing the haiga and haiku uh, seals on Hyakusen's work, on his Japanese career, as it were, in Japanese poetry. And his main influence uh, was Basho. And Busan kind of follows in the haiga haiku footsteps of Hyakusen, whereas Taiga is more interested in the Chinese style landscape. And the plum screen that you see on view by uh, Taiga was very much influenced by a work by Hyakusen, a very um, beautiful poetic uh, rendering on gold in ink of a pair of uh, aged plum trees. So th the poetry also goes into his vision of um, literati themes, but translated into a Japanese vision, I think. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you for, for that insight. And I think now it's the time maybe to open it up to questions from the audience. We do have um, some helpers along the side who have microphones, and, and please wait until you receive the microphone before you speak so we can be sure to record. So please, go ahead. How do you do? Thank you. Um, a question regarding the languages being used. Uh, you're talking about uh, haiku poetry and also uh, 17, a 17 syllable poetry. I'm not sure if that's haiku or a variation of a, that kind of uh, regimented style, but was Mandarin Chinese the lingua franca of, of these writers at that time, the Japanese like Hyakusen? Um, I'm unfamiliar with, with the Japanese script and the Chinese, so uh, I'm curious whether uh, they were writing in Mandarin or whether they were writing in colloquial Japanese with uh, uh, Mandarin characters or how that figured in at that point. And then I would be also curious in general with the trade um, w between Manila and uh, Jakarta and so forth, what the lingua franca of the trade was at that time. Uh, the 17 syllable is the haiku, what's now known as haiku, what's called haikai at the time, and that's in the Japanese language. But uh, you're right in your impression that the lingua franca among educated um, literati in Japan was Chinese. And every, uh, with this government encouragement of Confucianism and Chinese learning, there were many academies and every well-connected family would send their sons to one of these academies to learn Chinese. And Chinese poetry, um, there were poetry societies, Taiga belonged to one called Kontonsha, or the, um, uh, I forget what the translation is at the moment, but, and they were almost, they were actually based on the idea of the haikai poetry gatherings, sort of transliterating the Chinese gathering idea from haiku, although the language was Chinese. Does that answer some of your questions? And the language yeah. of trade? And in regard to the language in each port, all of those languages. Like I said, you'd have sort of neighborhoods of all Japanese. Uh, for example, in Manila, you had three, <coughs> as many as three to 5,000 Japanese, as many as five to 7,000 uh, Chinese. And within those communities, it's, there is no single language and you'd have people who spoke uh, Cantonese, people who spoke Fukienese, who spoke Hakka, all of the languages that of all the port cities that they were, there, were, there was trade between, you'd have representatives. Um, so every language 
uh, was spoken in every one of these ports. Multilingual. No universal. Uh, and this becomes a, a bit of, t uh, I'll tie almost anything into maps at this point. <laughs> <coughs> For example, uh, Ricci, Matteo Ricci's very famous maps uh, of the world that are produced in China and then very quickly distributed through the rest of East Asia. The names, so it's the first map that uh, Chinese characters are used to uh, create the sounds of all of the places of the world. However, if you look uh, and actually read all of those place names, they're using, they're transliterating not just uh, a Japanese name or a Chinese name. They're, uh, for example, it's how the Dutch pronounce the, the name of Taiwan or how the, the Malay name for a place as opposed to, as we all know, there are several islands, uh, strips of rock that are in the China seas that the Chinese call it one thing, the Japanese call it another thing, the Koreans call it another thing. So the naming of places is uh, immensely complicated when you start to look at some of the maps and mapping for this very reason. Because all of these languages are used and these place names are called something different depending on the context and the person you're talking to. If you use the, the wrong name, they won't know where you're talking about. So it, Again, it goes to the complexity of, of these networks. And uh, it's still, th there's more sea trade in that route, uh, that whole region, than anywhere else in the world. It still continues to this day, which is why it's uh, become uh, highly politicized of late. I just want to add one thing really quickly is that in a lot of these port cities, people intermarried from different cultures and the translators were very important. So even this Kaksinga who I mentioned, he had a Japanese mother and Chinese father. So, um, you know, that I think is not atypical. So he's a, the scion of a Chinese family of m maritime traders who's born in Japan of a Japanese mother. And so right there, there's a major figure who's multilingual from the start. And so it's very comfortable, you know, they don't see it as separate sort of, or, or barriers. They see it as, as creating exactly that, a kind of, a, it's their fluid environments. And so the more languages you speak, the more able you are to negotiate and work directly with each one of these traders from all of these different places. Hi, uh, thank you all for those talks. As Elise said, if big thoughts happen in small huts, you prove that big thoughts can happen in small talks today. So <laughs> thank you very much. I'm curious about, um, at, at this time, a popular practice in the Chinese literati painters were collaborative works, either collaborations between painters or painters and calligraphers. And I'm wondering if that practice um, came to Japan and if Hakusan participated and um, if passed that down to the other Nanga painters. There, um, yeah, this, there certainly were collaborative works um, and often the Obaku monks were asked to do inscriptions on paintings. Uh, Taiga in particular, we have inscriptions by other Chinese. Uh, Hyakusen, I only know of one uh, work that has a Chinese inscription by um, Hattori Nangaku, another Confucian scholar in Kyoto. But he does a lot of uh, joint works in the haiga, where he does the painting and someone else writes the haiku. Uh, one of his main collaborata collaborators was a na man named Takebe Ayatari, who was a good friend of his and a publisher of many of his haiku works. And that's where we see the collaboration, um, as far as I know, in Hyakusen's works rather than in the Chinese side. But it certainly was a, a tradition in China as well.
Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I have a question when uh, Felice was showing us um, E.K. Taiga's um, hut, and you were mentioned that's a painting from Kawabata. Uh, I'm interested in how Kawabata get interested in collecting the Nanga painting. Uh, Um, I'm not sure how he acquired that album. Do you remember? <laughs> Kyoko, Kyoko worked on that catalog as well. Um, but it, apparently he always had it by his bedside. And uh, not only the images, but the, the poems inscribed, the Chinese poems in this case, by uh, Chinese poets, but inscribed by Taiga or Busan, whoever did the painting. Um, were very dear to Kawabata's heart. I don't remember. It, they're now a, a national treasure, designated national treasure. And they were commissioned by a, a Japanese patron. And it's not clear whether Busan and Taiga actually worked together. We think they worked separately on each of their albums. And then the albums were presented as a joint work. There doesn't seem to be much interaction between Taiga and Busan, as opposed to Hyaksen and Busan and Hyaksen and Taiga. So um, I, I just want to add something real quick. I don't know about that particular um, instance and Kawabata's interest, but at that time that he was living, especially in the early 20th century, there was a great deal of resurgence of interest in Nanga painting on the part of intellectuals. And there were a number of important uh, writers, Natsume Soseki, for example, also had an interest in literati painting. And so it was, just something even and even you know people who are journalists uh, west and did western things and you know them for their more um, cosmopolitan western outlook privately they would build sencha tea rooms and collect uh, Chinese or Japanese literati paintings to put in them and that was their private personal side the intellectuals that Pat referred to is the Kosugi Hoan, whose images I showed a couple of examples of. And he initially studied in the West and then turned to China and then turned back to the Japanese tradition. So there's often this kind of ambivalence among, especially in that early period of influence and returning to the literati tradition. You, yeah. I have a, a, sorry, I have a connoisseurship question, uh, and that is, um, you know, if you were to look at the, the paintings on display downstairs and not know what they were, uh, would you be able to detect a difference between the Chinese paintings and the, and the Japanese um, Nanga paintings? Just in, and that's that's a okay. thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, well, there are certain certain aspects of the paintings that I think we can look at to, that help us sort of um, understand that uh, um, there is some copying going on. For instance, in Kian's work, uh, we look at, at the flatness of the of the uh, surface and uh, the possibility that he was looking at woodblock printed books and interpreting those and. And, and that sort of transference of, of a style, I think, is, is part of the difference uh, that I see. Um, and then um, there are techniques that Chinese painters use, um, certain kinds of brush strokes that I see in Hyakusen's work some slight misunderstanding of what those were intentionally, and that they sort of come out uh, in interesting kind of characteristics that he adopts that you would never see a Chinese painter use. Uh, for instance, yesterday I was walking around the gallery with Arnold Chang, who's a, a noted Chinese painter himself, and, and we were talking about brush strokes and about uh, how you learn how to 
paint in the Chinese style, and there are certain formula for different kinds of brush strokes, and that uh, in within some of the, especially the early Nanga painters, and especially uh, I think in Hyakusen's work, there's some some basic misunderstanding of transference of of different kinds of styles. That's not to say that they're they're wrong overall, but that they they don't follow the um, patterns that the Chinese had had. Uh, set up over centuries of how to paint a, a Chinese painting and how to build up a land mass by different kinds of brush strokes and so forth. And then I think within the later Nanga painters, especially Busan, there's a different sort of attitude towards uh, the intimacy that you see within the landscape, uh, particularly in larger scale paintings where you're invited into the scene through very specific characters who are uh, quite appealing in their presentation. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Busan's um, West Lake, West Lake in Spring, where he positions a, a figure right in the front of the of the composition, and and you're invited into the scene in a way that that is much more Japanese, in my estimation, than you would see in a in a Chinese landscape. But there are a whole bunch of different components for, you know, addressing what what was coming out of China and how it influenced these artists and then what they actually did with that information and how they created their um, particular landscapes. I think in terms of, uh, of the um, haikai and, the, and the, the poetry and and imagery, that is very, to my eye, that's very, very Japanese and, and it's very centered around a kind of a Japanese aesthetic that's quite different than the than the more uh, dramatic landscape paintings. But maybe Richard has some ideas as well about that. So are there um, any other questions or? It's kind of hard to see from here. I yeah. Know it's all of a sudden and we have, um, Well, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to our speakers, please, Pat, Richard. Really great talks. Um, and I, uh, I welcome you to come down and spend some time in the galleries. I'm planning on going down to look at some of the paintings again myself after these illuminating talks. And um, I hope to see you in the galleries frequently in the next couple of months. The show is open until uh, February 2nd, so you have lots of time to enjoy it. Thank you.